Hi, I'm Deborah Holcher, editor of Michigan Today. In this episode of Listen in Michigan, we explore the mysterious life of one-term Michigan governor and former U of M regent Chase Salmon Osborne, a swashbuckling Horatio Alger type with a bizarre secret that lay unexplored for 100 years. Osborne was an iron prospector, a newspaper magnate, a politician. He was a native of the Sioux and spent much of his life on Michigan's Upper Peninsula in his compound on Sugar Island. Despite its remote location, Osborne's headquarters was a revolving door of dignitaries, cultural icons, politicians, and titans of business. In the summer of 1937, one of those visitors was a sculptor Carlton Angel, the artist behind the Pumas at the Natural Science Museum. U of M President Marion Burton had commissioned Angel to create a bust of Osborne to commemorate his contributions as a university regent from 1908 to 1911 and governor from 1911 to 1913. For six weeks, Angel and his wife lived on Sugar Island with Osborne and his adopted daughter, Stella Nova, a beautiful poet and a U of M graduate in creative writing. In 1931, the Osbournes had adopted Stella Nova when she was 37 years old. And curiously, Mrs. Osborne no longer lived on the property. Historians through the years were either incredibly respectful or lacked any semblance of curiosity. One newspaper article is literally titled, A Daughter at 37. The remote location served the arrangement well, but according to alumna and author Mary Crum Schultens, it's likely the angels observed some curious behavior during their six weeks with father and daughter. Schultens, who goes by the pen name A. Arbor, spelled with a U, by the way, is the author of the novel Ward, Wife, Widow. She uses that summer of 1937 as the setting for her novel about Stella Nova, a woman who willingly chose to live a secret, sublimating her very existence and talent while dedicating her life to this eccentric older man. But why would anyone do this? The answer started to form at U of M's Bentley Historical Library when Mary discovered 600 pages of correspondence. 600 pages. Much of it candid, explicit, and ardent that passed between Osborne and Stella Nova prior to her adoption. That trove of letters revealed a truth far stranger than the average historical fiction could ever promise. Listen in as Mary, an Ann Arbor native and daughter of UM biologist Howard Crum, who taught here for 30 years, explains how she felt obligated, driven actually, to let Stella Nova tell her story after all these years of living in the shadows. Here's Mary with some background on Chase Club. He loved Michigan. He just had such a love for Michigan and he never attended, although Stella Nova did and got her master's degree. He's a dreamer and he can make these things come true uh, because he just, he has this tenacious spirit. He's sort of a frontiers person at the time. He's going to Wisconsin and he's working in lumber camps and he's setting up, um, he was very courageous. He would set up a newspaper office um, in a mining town and then he would expose what was going on, you know, with criminals and then his life would be in danger. I mean, he actually was shot at. Um, in while he was in one of his newspaper offices. And so he, he wanted to tell the truth. Very interesting. He wanted to tell the truth about, you know, politics and, um, things going on, but he couldn't tell the truth about his own life. And one of the reasons he only wanted to be a one-term governor is because he wanted to tell the truth. And he was for prohibition at one time. And he knew that that would doom a second term. And then he changed his mind. He had his moments of being a little bit humble at times and changing his mind, admitting a mistake, did not admit a mistake about his relationship with Stella Nova. (laughs) Um, He was responsible for the first workers' comp legislation in the state. So he really felt for the miners and for the, the people that work at the Sioux. He's the person who's responsible for the Mackinac Bridge. I mean, that's huge. And so he was very progressive. But where he wasn't progressive (laughs) was that he did not want to damage his reputation by having a girlfriend. And so he came up with this ruse that they lived with for decades that he and his wife Lillian, whom he was not divorced from at the time, he decides to adopt 
this graduate student in English at University of Michigan to be his paramour and he could travel with her and say, this is my daughter. And he wasn't lying. He had adopted her, but all the, all the documentation online and in books, biographies that have been written about Chase Osborne, all of them say Lillian and Chase Osborne adopted Stella Lee Brunt when she was 37. And I'm thinking, this does not make any sense. How do you convince a wife that you're going to do this? This doesn't make any sense. And I got in touch with one of the great grandsons and he was rattling this paper on the phone. I'm going to send you a PDF that you're going to find quite interesting. And it was the separation decree that Chase and Lillian signed in 1923, that this was not a platonic relationship. This was a way for them to live in that time period as husband and wife, but not legalize it. The spark that lit the whole story for her and for him was she was in graduate school at Michigan, President Burton. He wanted to do something that was groundbreaking at the time. And so President Burton thought, well, I would love to have an artist in residence, but I don't know how I would fund it. And I wanna get Robert Frost here on campus at the University of Michigan. So the first person he thinks about contacting for money is former governor Chase Osborne. He says, I'm sorry, I just can't at this time. And then he realizes, wait a second, that's when you should give is when you feel like you can't. So he had a very kind of Christian humanities kind of uh, sensibility. So he gives $5,000 to bring Frost here for the first um, residency. So guess who ends up going to seminars that are given by Frost? Yeah, stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So Stella Nova is one of the secret editors of the Whimsies. It was uh, five or six women and they never even told people that it was men or who they were. They wanted to be secret. Again, women in that era, would they have been taken seriously? So Frost even writes them a poem. They are able to meet with a prof at a professor's home and see Frost on a number of occasions. He critiques her work. He hurts her feelings, but she's just enamored with him. And she wants to thank the person who's responsible. She has no idea who's responsible. And then he is so enamored with her letters. I think he's mainly enamored with how enamored she is with him. So he saves them. Not only does he save them, but he annotates them and returns them to her. You know, an exclamation part. It's like, you are being ridiculous or you are being, you know, too sensitive or we, we just need to be friends. We'll be nothing more than friends. And then he'll draw her back in. Um, but they were pen pals for quite a number of years before they actually met in person, um, I believe, at an alumni event in New York City. She was working for a publisher. And that's where I think they met and things got physical. <laughs> She was always wanting to be more in his life. And he was equivocating all the time. He couldn't make up his mind. He'd say, let's write once a year to one another. This is too much. Be my friend in caps and nothing more. And then maybe they would meet in person or he would write a PS to that letter that was sort of telling her the opposite. So I think once they found the solution, the solution worked for him. And I think that he, I think he was constant in her life as her loving partner. Okay, she was from Hamilton, Ontario, and her mother remarried, and she never mentioned her father. She disliked her stepfather. That did not work out well, and I don't think that her mother was happy either. There's, there's a lot of correspondence I've read between she and her mother. And so she graduates from high school like four years later than most people, because she has to raise money to go. So she's a, she's a fish out of water when she gets to Michigan. She's older. And the young men don't appeal to her. They're too young for her. 
And, you know, then she stumbles onto this man that funded the Frost residency. And then she writes to him and he's kind of a father figure, but she also has seen a picture of him that she puts on her dorm room wall and she can't tell people that she's corresponding with this guy. (laughs) I think he was 34 years older than she was, but she's falling in love with the younger picture of him because she read his biography, which is fascinating. Um, The Iron Hunter. And that takes his life up to 1919. So she's reading about him up until that point in his life. And, you know, he's got a very attractive picture of himself, ruggedly handsome, you know, and he had these arresting eyes. And so she, she falls in love with his biography. She falls in love with his image as a younger man. And he is very robust and everything. So, and then I took her from that girl, <laughs> that young woman of the, the one who's corresponding for 10 years, I took her to a point of, okay, now this isn't so fun anymore, what we're doing. You know, I'm pretty frustrated. Um, Having a child now has passed me by. Um, And I don't think she would continue to be that doting person. Yes, um, devoted, but not doting. And so that's where I meet her in 1937, 38, is she's no longer doting. She's a little irritated. (laughs) His uh, camp on Sugar Island, I mean, it was a revolving door of who's who. (laughs) People paid court to him. He was so well-known and people really did. They beat a path to his door, even though the path was across a ferry on the St. Mary's River and down corduroy roads, dusty, to get to their very remote Duck Island property on Sugar Island. And so they had many guests. And so here she was. Um, being able to live privately with him for long periods of time, but also these guests are always coming. And so that's why when I found out that an art professor that worked at the museum, uh, Carlton Angel, who is responsible for the Pumas, everybody knows about the Pumas that were in front of the Natural History Museum. He was commissioned by President Burton to go up and spend six weeks on Sugar Island and study for the bus that then was in the Michigan Union for years and years and years. That gave me the catalyst for, oh, it's going to be that summer and I'm going to put everything there. And that's when the conversations are going to take place. And, you know, they're definitely going to uh, find out how difficult this man is and how fascinating and how worthy of, you know, a tribute, but also that he, he's a strange human being as well. And also there's um, photographs of Carlton Angel finishing the bust with Chase Osborne right there outside his library on Sugar Island. And the Bentley found that for me without me asking, without me knowing that it existed. The Bentley found it and it's in the book, but now it's in the basement of the union in a storage locker. Carlton Angel wrote a, uh, it was in the university record. He wrote an account of it. And his wife was with him too. This is when, uh, particularly his wife would have time to observe and go, what is going on here? And then I could put myself kind of in that story. Like if I were visiting for six weeks, wouldn't I see some stuff? Wouldn't I be kind of questioning like, what is going on? Um, And also there'd be tension with Stella Nova and Chase having to live under the scrutiny for a long period of time. I fell in love with them as people, even though they were both, I think, kind of difficult people. I fell in love with them as a couple. Um, and I was, I felt compelled to tell their story, absolutely compelled. I published about a hundred pages of those letters at the end of my novel. Is it okay to publish such graphic stuff? Her letters weren't, they're very ardent. His are ardent and also very specific. Younger women who read it, they're very angry with Chase. Older women are angry with her. I think she got almost all she wanted out of it. She wanted to be with him. She didn't get a child. She didn't get to be his wife, but she she signed on with her eyes wide open, given the times and to never tell anybody. And I, you know, I struggled with it. I really, I really thought about it a long time. And I thought, wait a second, I really think Stella Nova wanted somebody to find this. How do you decide that you're going to dump this treasure trove of personal correspondence at the University of Michigan and not expect that somebody's going to come looking one day. I think she wanted to be validated for her actual position in his life. Nobody would leave this. She would burn this. And it wasn't that she just left one stray 
incredibly ardent graphic letter that Chase wrote to her about their physical relationship. But I it, I found several. So it's not like, oh, that was stuck in between and oh, I never meant to. And his were typed. And she begged him. She begged him in her letters to marry her. And she made a case for him divorcing. He would answer back very um, curtly and also at length that he would never divorce. He would never consider that. He had four living children and he would not pass on the name of somebody who would divorce their mother. I felt very sad for Stella Nova. Uh, and he renamed her. When he adopts her, he renames her. And I'm thinking, who allows themselves to be renamed and have their life defined by a secret? You feel sorry for them from our perspective as women in our time. And certainly there are women who, who give up things, um, very fundamental things to be with a certain person. I think that in some ways she was happy with her choice because I think it was a true love story. I felt like she was speaking to me and that she wanted to be heard. She was a poet but she didn't write about her life. She wrote about nature and she's, her poetry sounds very, very much like Robert Frost. You know, I'm a few years into the research about this and the creativity and I go to the Bentley and I think, what if there's a scrap? You know, I've got, I've got the PDF of the separation decree. So I'm on the right track here, okay? So I go to the Bentley and I thought, I'm gonna look for a scrap of correspondence because the Osbournes gave boxes and boxes and however they measure that, you know, yard feet. And I thought, I'm just going to look for one letter. Maybe it just can even confirm beyond the separation. Well, like 600 pages of correspondence. And it, it was very candid, shall we say. I was shocked. I can't even imagine the feeling of finding 600 pages of correspondence. <laughs> It was like Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, birthday, all rolled in one. <laughs> I cannot believe this. And the language. So the, the correspondence started in 21 and ended in 31 when he adopted her. And then there was no need for this correspondence because they were then going to live together as family, however they defined it. I think he got more and more eccentric, still had his faculties. There was no question. He was still a very erudite man. But I, I think his wife, maybe this was not what she envisioned, but Stella Nova was okay with it. He started corresponding with Stella Lee Brunt in 1921. And I think she got wind of it. And by 23, she, she realized this is, I, I can't live with this. She leaves the scene. She goes to Wisconsin. Um, they lived in the Sioux. And then he had the, his camp, his property, which he donated to the University of Michigan in the 20s. Um, which is still a nature preserve uh, that um, University of Michigan Biological Station oversees. Stella Nova was okay with it. Her life was books and research and writing and poetry and nature um, poetry and helping this man write his books. I think she was fine with the isolation. How would you classify this? Is this like as inspired by like do you, in how much is you and how much is actual history? So much of it is true because I'm not that good a novelist. <laughs> I read so much in their letters about how they worded things and that I felt like I could write in both of their voices because like I've heard your voices in the letters. I mean, it's there. I can adopt it. And, you know, he's he's kind of he's so colorful and outrageous. And so many of the outrageous things that he says in the novel, he actually said, he actually wrote them down. He actually said them or people reported that he'd actually said these things. But also in reading all these letters, I realized they they really were soulmates. She, she really wanted to be with him and he really wanted to be with her. And she ended up writing many books with him. Um, you know, she put her skills to use that mm -hmm. she learned at the University of Michigan and also working for a publisher in New York City. And they published uh, the Hiawatha, the big tome. You know, her name is on there as a co-author. And so I think she had an interesting life with this very strange man. <laughs> and I've tried, I thought maybe I could get the adoption records, but they're sealed. Because I thought, well, that'd be interesting because I wanted to see his Lillian's name on the adoption. And then Stella Nova thought that after his wife died, that there was no reason why they couldn't get married, but he still didn't do it. And she spent the rest of her life after, because there was a 30 plus years difference in their ages. She spent the rest of her life after he died uh, protecting his legacy. 
sure, she made a choice that made her happy in some respects, but she deserves to be heard that this was not easy. I'm going to give her a chance to speak because I think she really wanted it. She left those letters. I, I'm convinced she wanted to speak. I just love the idea that Stella Nova is speaking to Mary from the past through these letters. Stella Nova found just the right person to tell her story that she was never able to share during her own life. This is Mary's debut novel, and she's now working on a piece about a family of lighthouse keepers, also historical fiction, also set in Michigan, and also requiring research at the Bentley Historical Library. Who knows what she's going to find this time. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you next month. Till then, as always, go blue.